Kat Bohannon Eve How the Female Body Drove 200 Million Years of Human Evolution For too long, science has ignored women. Until recently, most medical studies were done almost exclusively on males. Yes, even animal studies. No wonder no one thought to ask what role the female body played in the evolution of our species. As it turns out, it was a big one. New research is overturning outdated male-centric assumptions about how modern humans came to be. This witty blink synthesises insights from evolutionary biology, neuroscience and anthropology to rewrite our outdated origin story. Blending evolutionary science with urgent social critique, it reveals how female biology shaped everything from tool use to cognition to disease risk, from hips to hormones, it will change how you think about gender, health and being human. Communication through milk The name Eve brings to mind the biblical figure known for having been created from Adam's rib. But the truth is, human evolution has been driven by a long lineage of exceptional Eves. Female ancestors whose remarkable adaptations propelled the human story. Their bodily innovations to protect and provide for the next generation became integral strands of our biology and psychology as Homo sapiens. They still affect us today, and without them, none of us would be here. Meet Morganucodon or Morgi, our first Eve. Morgi was a mouse sized, insect eating mammal that lived alongside dinosaurs over 200 million years ago. Morgi and her ancestors laid soft-shelled eggs that needed to be kept moist, so she secreted a special mucus from her skin. When babies hatched, they would lick up this nutritious goo, essentially the first mother's milk. Over millions of years, this mucus evolved into proper milk and the skin patches into nipples and breasts. Milk addressed two big problems for mammal babies, hydration and disease prevention. Breast milk provided nourishment and immunological benefits without exposing vulnerable newborns to pathogens in standing water. What's more, breast milk isn't just a one-way street. It's tailored by babies themselves through the upsuck. As babies nurse, their saliva is sucked back into mom's nipple, telling her milk ducts what the baby needs to fight infections and grow. This ongoing mother-baby conversation also serves another key purpose – social bonding and emotional regulation. Of course, breasts later became secondary sexual characteristics, but the evolutionary pressure to grow breasts had little to do with men's gaze. Rather, breasts may have gotten larger and more front-facing to enable breastfeeding while walking upright. Later, the evolutionary innovation of breastfeeding would shape cities and civilizations millions of years later. In ancient cities like Babylon, Thebes and Nineveh, wet nurses enabled elite women to feed many more babies than they could on their own, facilitating rapid urban expansion. Breasts and their milk are but one example of the ways female bodies safeguard the next generation. If milk evolved not just to feed but to expand communities, what else might we reimagine about what women's bodies mean? The womb as a battlefield. What do you think of when you hear the word pregnancy? A magical, almost transcendent experience of creating life? Or have you actually been pregnant? Far from the idealised, cheerful version that's sold to us, pregnancy is a biological battle. Human reproduction intrinsically pits the mother's health against the demands of the fetus. The uterus prepares itself for invasion by building a thick lining each month. The lining enables the mother's body to maintain a buffer between herself and a fetus vying for her resources. This lining is shed monthly, resulting in menstruation as a defence mechanism against aggressive, nutrient-hungry embryos. Only three mammalian species, elephant shrews, bats and humans, menstruate like this. Scientists theorise this adaptation helped us survive increasingly taxing pregnancies 
as fetal size grew. Even in contemporary America, pregnancy and childbirth remain profoundly dangerous endeavours. For example, preeclampsia, a serious condition characterised by soaring blood pressure and potential organ damage, now occurs in over 5% of US pregnancies. Under normal circumstances, the placenta cleverly manipulates the mother's blood pressure just enough to divert extra blood flow to itself. But when this placental sabotage spirals, seizures, stroke and death can follow. Why do such conflicts occur at all? Because a mammalian fetus, from conception onward, is not inherently benevolent and its best interests don't perfectly align with the mother's health. Even in seemingly healthy pregnancies, the mother's body labours exhaustedly to achieve equilibrium between self-defence and nourishment of the fetus. An unequal truce persisting for nine arduous months. Neither struggling embryos nor labouring mothers are to blame, it's just biology. But pregnancy idealisation obscures the fact that suffering, disability and death are always possible outcomes. In order to give life, women make profound sacrifices of health, comfort, freedom and bodily autonomy. This deserves acknowledgement and support unmatched by romanticism. From gynaecology to world domination. Have you ever wondered how humans managed to spread across the globe and become the dominant species? After all, we're not the fastest or strongest. We reproduce pretty slowly and our children are dependent on us for a long time. One common answer is that men started to wield tools, swinging hammers and throwing spears. But perhaps the revolution came with an invention that couldn't be preserved as neat archaeological artefacts, an invention for and by women. It all started with Homo habilis, another one of our ancestral Eves. Giving birth was already treacherous for her. Babies' heads grew ever larger, while walking upright had made her pelvis more narrow. This design flaw was a major evolutionary disadvantage as reproduction frequently failed. Yet here humans are today, eight billion strong. How? Habilis and her descendants discovered the solution, gynaecology. Every ancient culture in history has practised gynaecology. Everything from midwifery to herbal abortifacients to fertility control. It allowed women to preserve their health, space out pregnancies, terminate unhealthy ones and take charge of their reproduction overall. It seems likely that Homo habilis was the first of our ancestors to figure out that she needed help with giving birth. Unlike other mammals, humans never developed an automatic miscarriage response to environmental threats. Instead, female innovation stepped in. Habilis and her peers formed close-knit female networks in which they could safely assist with risky labours. They shared knowledge of fertility-influencing plants. Gradually, a collaborative culture of midwifery and birth control emerged. Fast forward to Homo erectus, one of our most successful ancestors. She inherited gynaecological knowledge and improved on it, using it to spread far across Africa and Asia. This knowledge developed over time, and today we have birth control pills, C-sections, epidurals, and other tools to manage pregnancy and birth. Gynaecology was perhaps our most pivotal invention. Behavioural changes gave us control over what normally would have taken eons of evolution. That reproductive control is why our species survived and multiplied against all odds. So next time you think of humanity's great technological innovations, don't imagine the atomic bomb or the internet. Instead, Picture the speculum, the diaphragm, the pill. Women's health technology made human civilization as we know it possible. Our success story starts with a long, unbroken chain of mothers and daughters, midwives and medicine women, to a far greater extent than men with weapons. The not-so-different female brain. What makes women different from men? This question has occupied scientists and philosophers for ages. Often the answer comes back to hormones, emotions, childbearing. 
often framed as differences in the female brain. But what does neuroscience really tell us about those differences? As it turns out, not as much as you might think. Despite age-old stereotypes of the moody, math-challenged, weaker sex, adult men's and women's brains are remarkably similar in structure and function. While boys and men tend to do slightly better on tests that require spatial reasoning, girls and women do better on tests related to language skills. But overall, sex differences in aptitude and behaviour have more to do with socialisation than with hardwired biology. Take intelligence. Up until adolescence, boys' and girls' IQ test performance is pretty much the same. Even differences in average math scores narrow when controlled for economic status. So intelligence is not so much inborn as cultivated through opportunity and experience. What about emotions? Here, biological factors like hormones and neural wiring come more into play. The ebb and flow of estrogen and progesterone can cause some women to feel more moody and emotional around their periods as well as during pregnancy. Women are also more likely to be diagnosed with clinical depression, but it's hard to say whether this reflects a biological bias or a culture that still encourages men to suck it up. Despite a possible proclivity for mood disorders, women are less likely to express stress through self-destructive behaviour like drug use or suicide. The female brain also seems to be more robust physically. For instance, the protective effects of estrogen and progesterone seem to help women recover better from traumatic brain injuries. In essence, men and women are not so different. The differences that do exist hardly justify the myth of men as stronger, smarter or more resilient. So why do sexist stereotypes persist? The answer lies in everything outside of us, in the culture we inherit and the environment we grow up in. During adolescence, gender socialisation intensifies. The anxiety that one is being constantly watched and judged places the brain in a constant state of low-level stress. Needless to say, this can hamper academic performance. Then there are psychological mechanisms like the stereotype threat. Tell a girl she won't do well on a math test because she's a girl and she won't. Unequal expectations become self-fulfilling prophecies. But change is happening. As long-standing sexist beliefs buckle, so may constraints on what it means to have a woman's mind. Rather than predetermined destiny, Differences between men and women reflect a complex interplay among bodies, brains and the societies we build together. Living longer with menopause One real undeniable difference between the sexes is that women live longer than men, over five years on average. The reason why may have to do with something our society prefers not to discuss. Menopause. From an evolutionary perspective, menopause is a mystery. Most species keep reproducing until they die to pass on their genes. But human females stop being fertile often decades before the end, living up to a third of their lives after menopause. Why? In the grandmother hypothesis, menopause evolved because postmenopausal women are able to help care for their grandchildren without being burdened with their own kids. But menopause seems to have evolved before humans regularly lived long enough to provide extra childcare. And it has evolved in other species, like killer whales, where grandmothers are not a thing at all. Instead, menopause may be linked to humans' increasing lifespan more generally. As societies developed agriculture and became more socially complex, having elderly people became evolutionarily useful. Their long lives allowed them to remember vital knowledge, such as how to survive food crises. So the social value of older people could have influenced evolution in a way that resulted in longer lifespans. And since women invest far more in producing offspring and preserving the species, there may have been more evolutionary pressure to prolong female lives compared to males. Menopause seems to help with that. From menopause onwards, the edge that women have over men in terms of mortality increases over time. For instance, over 80% of centenarians are female. 
men are far more likely to fall prey to the big three killers, heart disease, cancer and lung disease. Why female bodies and menopausal bodies in particular save them off more efficiently is still unresolved. But estrogen and other female sex hormones seem to have protective effects for immune function, heart health and cholesterol levels. So the female ability to outlive male peers by years is central to human social evolution. As women, we can expect to live longer than our husband, brothers or male peers despite similar lifestyles. Learning to cope with their absence is a deeper story, but perhaps we can find solace in our resilience. Love or the Devil's Bargain What truly separates humans from other intelligent social species like chimps? It's not big brains or opposable thumbs. It's our intricate, long-lasting and emotionally intense bonds, including with non-relatives. We don't just reproduce. We make love. In the animal kingdom, this type of romantic love is unmatched. But how did it evolve? The mainstream scientific view is that early human females made a sort of devil's bargain. Initially, they lived in promiscuous matriarchal groups. But as giving birth grew more challenging, they needed more resources to successfully raise offspring. So they started offering individual males exclusive sexual access and certain paternity of their children, in exchange for food and protection. These individualised bonds added to the assistance offered by the larger female collective. Perhaps this is how romantic love evolved, but it's also how male-centred institutions like inheritance were able to take root. Sons could be ensured they were related to fathers, enabling wealth and status to pass down over generations. Tight male coalitions formed around these new certainties. Over thousands of years, this allowed men to accumulate more and more structural power. Unintentionally, by repeating this pattern generation after generation, our forefathers traded away the very communal structures that once kept males in check. But we shouldn't blame them. They had their own complex motivations, innovating to overcome a challenging evolutionary time. In the end, thinking about why human bonds evolved may be less relevant than thinking about how they still affect us. Are remnants of the devil's bargain still limiting us today? Are our romantic relationships supportive, cooperative and loving? Or do exploitative patterns persist? Regardless of origins, we can consciously shape the future. For every single woman today is an Eve in her own right. The choices we make today, the actions we take, can shape the future of human history.